everybody. Thank you for being here and welcome from wherever you are and whatever your time zone may be. Thank you for your interest in the subject we are addressing today. Share the care and transform tomorrow. The event is the third one about unpaid care work that Make Mothers Matter is organizing. Unpaid care work is something we all do at various levels, for our children, for our parents, our neighbors, our friends. The problem is that although it is vital and necessary, it is mostly overlooked because it is unpaid. And also it is at the root of gender inequalities because it is unequally distributed and mostly performed by women and particularly mothers. By drawing the attention on this vital activity, MMM wants to bring about changes to eradicate these unjust consequences linked to unpaid care work. Our first event on unpaid care work was in 2020, care and education cornerstones of just and sustainable economies. It drew the attention on its eco economic importance. In 2021, it was changing the narratives about unpaid care work and the economy. We discussed how to change the perception of unpaid care work and how it should be more socially, it should be more valued socially and economically. Today, it's the third episode of our series, and it will address the sharing of unpaid care work and its responsibilities. We will have translators from Spanish to English and from English to French. You can choose your language at the bottom of your screen. And our moderator today will be Nikki van der Gag. They could not be a better one for our subject today. Nikki is a gender specialist, focusing on the inclusion of fathers and boys in gender equality. She is a very valued member of MMM board, and also she has a special interest in unpaid care. You will find her full bio on our website. Thank you so much, Nikki, for moderating this event. And before I give you the floor, here is a video from, for, from some of our MMM members from Africa. <music> sont relégués au plan de ménagère en travaillant à longueur de journée et l'exécution de leurs tâches s'apparente à un non-engagement des hommes à leur côté. L'absence des pères auprès des mères massifie la vulnérabilité de la femme. Il est donc important de partager le cœur en initiant des actions concrètes, car Ajad considère comme essentiel le rôle des pères. En cela, elle associe les hommes à la mise en œuvre du programme O3 sur l'éducation complète à la sexualité. Ajad insiste sur la scolarisation de la fille. Elle explique aux familles ce que représente la mère pour l'enfant, ce que représente le père pour l'enfant, en privilégiant l'intérêt familial au détriment des croyances culturelles qui relèguent les mères au second plan. Enfin, Ajad sensibilise les maris à prendre conscience du respect de leur engagement vis-à-vis -vis de leurs épouses. Fonder une famille constitue un projet commun, décidé consensuellement par deux partenaires de vie. Sa réussite engage les deux parties dans des activités et tâches qui requièrent des compétences tant spécifiques que collectives, mais surtout complémentaires, ainsi que des ressources physiques, 
intellectuelle, affective, spirituelle, des compétences sociales venant de chaque membre. Utsar promeut le partage équitable et responsable des travaux de cœur à travers deux messages clés, la synergie père-mère et homme-femme, une heureuse différence. Est-ce que, en tant qu'homme, en tant que garçon, vous pensez que c'est important de pouvoir préparer la nourriture à la maison Bon, nous pouvons aussi le faire si seulement, par exemple, la femme est malade. Et quand elle n'est pas malade Quand elle n'est pas malade, on peut toujours le faire pour montrer notre amour à elle, je pense. Je pense qu'un homme responsable peut aussi s'occuper de ses enfants, si, euh, même quand la femme est occupée à faire quelque chose ou pas. Moi, je pense que ces sujets, c'est parfois compliqué parce que ça s'est transmis de génération en génération. Parce qu'après, même nos parents nous disaient, mon homme est Aliak, il disait que l'homme ne doit pas pleurer. Et à, à, à un certain moment, même quand on est enfant, on montre que l'homme est toujours supérieur, que l'homme, il y a des choses qu'il ne peut pas faire. Il disait qu'on peut vouloir que ça se fasse, mais aux yeux des autres, ça crée déjà un problème. Ils disent, mais comment toi, tu, tu, tu peux faire ça Pourtant, c'est réservé qu'à ta femme. Donc, je pense qu'il faut aussi le côté de l'éducation qu'on va éduquer nos enfants pour leur montrer que l'homme et la femme, ils sont égaux. Comme ça, après, ils, quand ils seront grands, ils pourront aussi éduquer d'autres personnes. Je pense. Pour qu'une femme travaille, d'abord, il doit être éduqué. Et avant, on disait que les femmes n'avaient pas le droit d'aller à l'école, ce qui est en train d'être contredit aujourd'hui. Et donc, si elles partent déjà à l'école, c'est déjà une bonne chose de les initier à travailler aussi. Nikki, the floor is yours, and thank you very much. Merci, Anne-Claire. Bonjour, hello to everybody. I'm delighted to see so many attendees and um, this really, really important topic um, in this together, sharing the care transform tomorrow. The main purpose of this side event is to continue the discussion about how to lay the grounds for a more caring society. A society where care work is valued and more equally and fairly shared between men and women, between families, communities and the rest of societies. And we thought it would be nice to, to kick off with one, one last very short video just to give you a sense of what's going on around the world. I'm going to do a very short introduction and then you will be listening to the speakers. Um, so Valerie, could you just show the, the short man care video? Thank you. Né, a minha mãe, uma vez, quando ele bateu na porta, minha mãe abriu, ele estava alcoolizado, estava bêbado, e deu um soco. Tinha que mostrar que ele era um homem. بمجتمع بطبيعة الحال الرجل هو رأس المرأة يعني هاي الفكرة اللي موجودة والمرأة هي تابعة للرجل. بس أنت كفو قتي نبى أقوم هريج كل شوري تكابتين دي تباز. نوفتها دي كمل تانجي من نجرة زاموت. بريميا يا ميمة تما إندونيا كأن جين غيردا كراند كومات أكمتيني. Eu não estou mais aí. Mamãe me ganhou lá de novo. Eu aqui dentro ainda lá ganhou mais. Eu o que mais ia balar aí mano. Eu ficava dentro do meu quarto, digamos assim, trancado. Não, isso aqui ninguém mexe. A partir daquele momento ali, com eu vendo a história de cada um, aqui dali me serviu para que eu pudesse ser curado daquilo. Mata Islam pun ada lajau na. Ame masa tu nemu gila lagi. Benda ikak mang mage itu le engkau tak awal lagi tengok na. Umur tahu mana bad na, wata hiu berkon. Anak anda syarikat hiu berhitam aktar, wata anak hiu berkon. Anak anda syarikat kemana anak berhitam. Mukoga we, i move he boleh jual. Tiada mana mukoga wanji. Mungkin ni 
ni ibintu nawe bimushimye kuba yarihindutse bifite umusaruro ushimishije Essa ferramenta é poderosa, diante de uma comunidade de transformação. Ela não vem de um monte, ela vem pingo, pingo, pingo. Então, torna aquele rio forte. Thank you. I love that video, partly because it shows men and women talking about care, and partly that bit about the end that the rain doesn't, that comes one drop at a time and becomes the river. So I'm hoping that we are the river or part of the river. So just to go back to the beginning a little bit. So what do we mean when we talk about unpaid care? We mean the millions of hours of unpaid care and domestic work in the home, which is still carried out mainly by women and girls in every country in the world. Women still do between three and 10 times more work than men, and it's hugely undervalued and unvalued. And yet, it makes a major contribution to our economies. Put simply, our world wouldn't work without it. Globally, at least 16.4 billion hours, I can't even get my head around that number, 16.4 billion hours are spent on unpaid care work, the equivalent to 2 billion people working eight hours a day for no pay. If this is calculated on the basis of an hourly minimum wage, according to analysis by the International Labour Organization and McKinsey, it would add up to at least 9% of global gross domestic product. It's not just an economic argument, but the economic argument is there. And addressing the inequitable distribution of unpaid care work by sharing the care, as Anne Claire said, is key to advancing women's rights, to progressing gender equality, as well as improving relationships within the family, as we've just seen in that lovely film. Sharing unpaid care work equally with men and engaging them as involved fathers. And they don't have to be biological fathers, but fathers of men of any kind supporting children can lead to improved maternal and child health stronger or more equitable partner relations, a reduction in violence against women and children, and lifelong benefits for daughters and sons. Research also shows it makes men better fathers, improves their intimate relationships, and enhances their quality of life. Because it's really important to state, this work, this work is really sometimes very hard, but it's not a burden. Often it's talked about as a burden. It's often joyful and it's life affirming. And I think we have to get away from the idea of talking about unpaid care as a burden. It's also key to bringing about some of the systemic changes which are necessary to ensure a sustainable and resilient recovery from the pandemic, where care has been such a central topic, both inside and outside our homes. The good news is this is increasingly being recognized. Programs around the world, like the ones we've seen and the ones we're going to hear about that work with mothers and fathers, Others that work with communities, by governments, by the corporate sector, all of these are represented here today. And that, that's recognizing the fact that it's not just a matter of individuals changing their attitudes and behavior, men and women and people of all genders, but of, a, of structural changes that support them in doing so. And we're gonna hear about some of those later on. The fact that this topic is part of a high level political forum shows that the issue of care and in particular unpaid care is becoming a major topic of discussion at international level. It's key to achieving the 2030 development agenda. It's already enshrined in US sustainable UN Sustainable Development Goal 5 on gender equality. And it's also linked to many other sustainable development goals. So to move on to the really exciting bit of this panel, we've got four expert speakers. We're gonna focus on the work they're doing, their organizations are doing, the impact it's had and the changes that are needed. Each will talk about for about five minutes, and then we hope for a short conversation between them before turning it to you for questions. And do put your questions in the chat rather than the Q&A once the speakers have finished talking. So without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker. Um, Ilara, Ilaria Buscaglia is the program manager for the, for, 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 sorry, the Rwanda Men's Resource Center, short, RAMREC for short, which based in Rwanda. She started her career in academia. She worked for different universities in Italy and Rwanda as a lecturer, a researcher in cultural anthropology and gender studies. And in 2016, as an independent consultant, she provided technical support to different non-governmental organizations in Rwanda before joining RAMREC. So Ilaria, I'm delighted to have you with us to talk about 
under Barrow, which I think is one of the most wonderful programs. Um, can you tell us a bit about the Vander Barrow programme? What is it, what it stands for? What are some of the success stories and what are the main factors that led to this success? So I'm handing over to you now. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I am the program manager of RUAMREC. Uh, RUAMREC is a local NGO. We call it like a feminist men's movement, and we do implement uh, programs engaging men for transforming social norm. And one of them is Bandeberejo. Bandeberejo in Kenya Rwanda means role model. And we call it a gender transformative program that uses fatherhood to engage men in maternal, newborn, and child health with uh, exactly the aim of transforming gender norms in Rwanda. Uh, Bandeberejo is adapted from Program P for Rwanda, and uh, um, it is basically made of group education sessions. It's a curriculum made of 15 to 17 group education sessions where couples uh, expectant or with children under five um, are called and brought together to discuss different topics that go from pregnancy, antenatal care, um, the birth, uh, unpaid care work, gender-based violence, even alcohol consumption, and so many others. And they, sometimes men on their own, sometimes men and women together, they um, learn something, but they also discuss with a gender transformative approach. So they discuss and challenge existing gender roles, existing expectation, gendered expectations. And then they are given time to practice new behaviors in particularly men, for example, holding a baby or doing some uh, unpaid care work. And then they are invited to, to continue do at home. So they rehearse in the group educations, then they go back at home, they practice that and they, uh, they sort of learn. And then they come back to the group education session and they discuss how it felt. Um, and uh, if you move to the next slide, uh, maybe you might want to know where Bande Berejo is at the moment. So it was piloted until 2018 in four districts in Rwanda. Then in one of these districts, we had what is called the transition to scale. So we moved from an NGO-led model to a government-led model where the program is now implemented by the structure of the community health workers. And now we are ready for scale up. So we have really this hope that uh, the program implemented by community health workers can be um, scaled up nationwide. And um, maybe you want to know like what the main impacts of Bandeberejo are. Um, so it really has, it was, by the way, let me tell you that it was rigorously evaluated with two rounds of RCTs at 20 months after the interventions and with the same couple six uh, years after. So what we wanted to know was uh, what are uh, the, the, what is the impact of Bandeberejo across a wide range of outcome, the ones that you can see in the slides but also are these impacts sustained over time? Uh, because sometimes this type of interventions are evaluated just straight after, and we don't know if actually the change is, um, is, is sustained. And even the um, participants themselves, we have a quote of a woman who asks herself, oh, now after the Mandebere, who I really see my husband, he comes home, he um, does his share of unpaid care where he takes care of the children, but she was really wondering, will it last? So that's why uh, we conducted also a second round of RCT six years after. And I can tell you that all, <laughs> almost all um, impacts were sustained. In particular, maybe I can uh, um, let you know more about the IPV and gender-based violence one, if we move to the next slides. We found out that after six years, the um, intervention groups consistently showed um, lower rates of all forms of gender-based violence. So 35% less in terms of physical, 33% sexual violence, and then also economic violence and moderate or severe emotional violence. So this is like a very high impact of the program. And uh, it, it is also, as I said, uh, sustained, uh, sustained over time. Then other sorts of maybe gender related impacts uh, are related, for example, to a better share of unpaid care work, both men and women in the treatment groups, so the ones who were exposed to Bandeberejo intervention, they report a better, a better and a, a more equal share of unpaid care work. And even the minutes that both men and women reports about men's involvement in unpaid care work um, are more um, than the ones in the control group. So it really seems that the program had a very good, uh, a very good impact in that sense. And also in terms of childcare. So when we look in unpaid care, where we look specifically at childcare, 
uh, men spend more quality time with their children. They engage them, for example, in early learning, early development and learning activities. Uh, so talking to them, learning something new, like teaching them how to count, teaching, singing a song with them. So different activities that normally in Rwanda are not really seen as uh, men's, but now men and fathers, they really practice that. Um, so the program is successful and has been really successful. And I am very proud to let you know that even the government of Rwanda recommended it for SCADA because the evidence really showed that the impact was there and that it also um, like was across so many, so many outcome. And if you ask me probably why it was successful, I would say probably in terms of the change at the community level, it was successful for two main reasons. First of all, because uh, um, it really engages men uh, through fatherhood, which is a sort of a soft and easy entry point. It's easy to engage men in unpaid care work if you target them first as fathers. Um, and then it, it, it is also designed in a way that shows the benefits of such involvement, childcare, for example. It shows the benefits for the women's life. For example, they have more time to practice income generating activities and to contribute to the family's development. It also brings a benefit to the men themselves that really come to appreciate the time they spend, uh, they spend with, their, with their children and also the, the, the healthier relationship they build with, with their wife. Uh, so they really come to appreciate that for themselves as well. And then also the benefit for the family at large. And then it's successful also because it has a specific and explicit gender transformative approach. So it's not just about learning, it's about questioning, it's about challenging, it's about also being pushed in an uncomfortable zone whereby you also come to realize that what you have learned over your lifetime might not be what is the right or the best way of living your life and also sharing your life with your partner. And then we also um, had the chance to be highly supported by the Rwandan government and to work very closely with the, um, especially the Ministry of Health through the RBC um, and especially through the division of maternal, newborn and child health within the Ministry of Health. Um, so we were supposed by them and we worked with them very closely to even get access to the community health workers that are now implementing our program. And we also got uh, a very uh, strong support for, from the Ministry of Gender, like the day before last week, three days ago, the Minister of Gender was with us and she gave a speech to open um, an event that we had where we were sharing the findings of the second round of RCT. So we really have like the strong collaboration, especially because it's a program that also answers some of the priorities of the government. You might want to know that we have a newly revised gender policy that really asks for gender transformative programming and also for many engaged approaches. So I believe- Elaria, you nearly at the end, yeah. Yes, I am, I am done. So I, I believe that that's why like this alignment of the program priorities and also the government priorities, what really it makes it uh, kind of very, very strong. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm done and I'd be happy to answer any questions later. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I know you could have talked for half an hour or an hour. I mean, there's so much to say about this program. Just wanted to couple of, pick up on a couple of things. So program P is, it stands for Padre. It's a program about fatherhood that's being implemented in a number of, of different mm -hmm. countries, but I think Rowan, your program is one of the, the kind of um, highlights. Um, and you know, it's also about long-term impact. How often do you get to evaluate six years later? It's fantastic. And I think the fact that you're asking the women as well as the men is really important because often women have a different opinion on that um, too. And I think some of those themes are going to be picked up by our next speaker. So uh, Suna Hanoz Penny is Director of Strategy International Programs and Partnership at ACHEV, the Mother Child Foundation in, sorry, Mother Child Education Foundation in Istanbul, Turkey. Her work involves building collaborative partnerships while she manages the transfer and implementation of ACHEV's educational programs to local organizations in numerous countries, including Cambodia, Tanzania, Laos, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil. Soon as a Fulbright scholar and has studied in the US and Turkey, and she's presently pursuing a mid-career master in public administration at the Harvard Kennedy School. And that chair has also been part of the Men Care campaign for a very long time. So soon a couple of the themes that are similar are, Achev's run now trained, I think, two generations in running 
programs on parenting with both mothers and fathers. Um, they tell us about the program and a, a bit about the impact that you think it's had on them, on their families and on the wider community. Really delighted to introduce Sina. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, so it's a great honor to have this opportunity uh, for me to speak at this event on behalf of Achev. Um, I have to, first of all, thank Make Mothers Matter for the invitation to speak and to sit on uh, a panel with such esteemed group of panelists who've been playing a critical role in supporting long-term efforts and changing the narrative around unpaid care work and gender equal parenting. Listening to my uh, colleague uh, from Rwanda, I could see so many of the similarities. Uh, you can uh, go to the next slide. Um, so just for those who may not know about the work of Achev, uh, very briefly, Achev has had an incredible journey since its establishment in 1993 with the mission uh, of making a lasting contribution to society through the development of children and their environments all with evidence-based programs, intervention programs for young children and families um, through the implementation of its face-to-face -face, uh, education programs. As you can see on the slide, Achev has uh, reached over a million children, mothers, fathers, and women. Now, um, as you all know, achieving change in beliefs and attitudes and gender roles and improving women's status has been an extremely difficult part of Achev's work because uh, these are very taboo, sensitive, deeply ingrained cultural um, uh, issues. So these are social inclinations that cause negative outcomes faced by girls and women mostly. So this requires a normative shift. Um, a, a quick change overnight cannot happen as anyone who works in this area would know. So uh, how, do you, how do you make bring a big change in society uh, with programs and policies? And that goes way beyond that. So for this reason, uh, Achev has been the first organization in Turkey to work with fathers in an effort to engage men for gender equality. Um, if you can go to the next slide, let me quickly um, share with you the how it all began. So we truly believe gender equality begins in the home, begins in early childhood. Uh, the mother-child education program uh, has been transformational in that um, instead of a teacher, it leverages the mother in her natural educator role. It empowers the mothers as confident mothers, spouse, as an educator to their child. Um, and promotes the inclusion of children without um, those without an access to preschool. So it all started with the mother-child education program uh, for Achev, uh, and it was a system changer by expanding the narrow definition of preschool education and empowering the mothers. Um, if I, uh, just a quick share about the mothers who had attended the program. Just before you go to the slide, if you can stay on the mother's slide, thank you. Uh, the mothers who attended the program compared to those who did not attend, decreased the usage of their negative disciplinary methods. They feel more confident about their parenting skills. They improve their communication skills uh, with their spouse. Uh, they're more proactive in creating environments for their children to play in and many more. Um, next slide, please. Now this program actually uh, gave birth to the father support program because the father support program was developed in response to mothers who had participated in Achev's parenting and mother programs. Uh, and they said it would actually be very helpful um, to be able to educate and train the fathers as well and give them support. Uh, and with the idea that families um, families required unity in parenting. So Achev took up this challenge and started the father support program and it's been running now for two decades. Um, we also see exactly fatherhood as a space for uh, recreation of gender roles as an entry point to gender equality and involved fatherhood would mean a change in the direction of a more equitable household, uh, democratizing the home environment in other words. Next slide, please. 
So a um, lot of the impact evaluation program, uh, research done on the programs show um, very good outcomes for both mothers and fathers. Then next slide, please. What are the secret ingredients, so to say, for both programs? Basically, these are two generate, they, they have a two generation approach, combining the needs of children and parents uh, with very structured content adapted to the needs of the beneficiaries. Um, the parenting programs leverage the parents in their natural role as educators and empowers, empowers parents um, through very cost effective ways. Next slide. Uh, in the case of fathers, like I said, um, it's a primary prevention strategy targeting men to combat traditional gender norms while empowering men as active fathers. Um, model of working with a group of mothers and fathers have proven very effective in promoting behavior and attitude change. Um, it, it really instills effective communication uh, and behavior change. Now, uh, fathers who've participated in the program have changed their behavior towards their children and wives, including spending more time, refraining from physical punishment, being more tolerant, and having a more constructive engagement and dialogue with them. Uh, there are qualitative and quantitative research showing the impact of uh, non-authoritarian attitudes in fathers. Next slide and last slide. So the... Um, We've, we've come to understand a couple of things through these program implementations. Uh, parenting programs, early childhood, fatherhood, masculinities, these are closely interrelated and they really intersect in multiple ways. Um, so collaborating with men particularly uh, by supporting their fatherhood skills have proven extremely important and resourceful method, especially in Turkey's given context. Um, we've, we've realized we can't just, uh, though, uh, solely train fathers and mothers. We also have to uh, facilitate a much broader and longer term shift in their attitudes on gender equal parenting. And how do we do that? By advocating, uh, by creating advocates of change, by creating a norm more normative shift in society beyond programs and policies. Um, and um, I should end right now by saying, since my time is up, um, we know that these things are not going to happen overnight. Uh, there are quite a bit of challenges we're also um, um, uh, going against, and we can talk about this perhaps afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suna. Again, I know there was a lot more you could say, but that was a fantastic presentation. What was written on their t-shirts in that last slide? You're, in, you're muted. Sorry, Fathers for Change. I'll, I'll show it afterwards. Building a movement, lovely. Yes. Yeah. So hang on to your questions. We're going to move on to, to our, our next speaker. Um, building, building from, the, you know, thinking about the family, thinking about the community, um, and, uh, and now thinking about government. So I'm delighted to introduce La Lorena Villavicencio, who is a former MP in Mexico and who's got up with the dawn this morning to be with us she's based in Mexico so muchas gracias uh, Lorena. Lorena is the mother Lorena is the mother of Rodrigo and former federal I'm listening to it in French now let me just ch change that over um, she's held positions of popular representation and legislative activities for more than 20 years and during her term in office as a federal deputy, she participated in a large number of initiatives about the subjects that are her passion. So human rights, justice, children's and women's rights, um, labor rights for domestic workers, the wage gap and care work. She was involved in the single vital income as a measure to fight the economic emergency caused by the pandemic. And she's also written many, many articles in print and electronic media. So I'm delighted to introduce Lorena. Um, and to hear a bit more, Lorena, you have been key in trying to centre care in your government's policy priorities and interestingly to include the right to care in the Mexican constitution. So what impact would such a change have? And you've talked a lot about feminist and women's organisations. I'd be really interested to know what influence they've had in this initiative. So 
over to you, Lorena. Thank you very much. Eh, sí, eh, bueno, primero quiero agradecer la invitación de Make Mother Matter de Aniki y a Anne, también a Anne Claire y a todas las ponentes que están el día de hoy que me siento muy contenta de compartir este, este panel tan importante sobre el tema del derecho humano al cuidado digno y en este caso nuestro también al tiempo propio. Siempre es grato hablar de cuidados porque esto implica una reflexión sobre cómo se organiza la vida cotidiana de las personas y esto cómo impacta en la sostenibilidad de la vida. Y bueno, decir que eh, el trabajo de cuidados eh, sostiene la vida del conjunto de la sociedad porque es la condición que posibilita la existencia humana dado que las personas sin distinción alguna necesitan ser cuidadas en algún momento de su ciclo vital. Quiero comentarles que cuidados son todas aquellas tareas, actividades y apoyos indispensables para la satisfacción de las necesidades básicas de subsistencia y reproducción de las personas a lo largo de su vida. Las personas en condición de dependencia no solo son aquellas a las que se refieren normalmente eh, como las personas que tienen alguna discapacidad, los adultos mayores, los enfermos o los niños. En realidad, la dependencia la vivimos todas las personas en algún momento de nuestra vida. Entonces, pues por eso es, es tan importante los cuidados. Decir también que los cuidados por sí mismos rompen un paradigma el paradigma de la autosuficiencia, porque los seres humanos en general somos interdependientes. Ahora bien, es importante que los cuidados procuren aumentar la autonomía de las personas. Digamos, uno de los grandes propósitos para regular, en el caso mexicano, yo soy mexicana, eh, uno de los motivos grandes que teníamos para regular el derecho al cuidado a nivel constitucional era justamente el fortalecimiento, entre otras cosas que ahora comento, aumentar la autonomía de las personas. Como aquí se ha dicho ya por todos los ponentes, la carga de trabajo, normalmente la carga del trabajo del cuidado y de los trabajos del hogar, recaen fundamentalmente en los hombros de las mujeres. Somos quienes, eh, no solo somos quienes damos la vida a través del ejercicio libre de nuestra maternidad, sino la sostenemos. Y esto quedó de manifiesto durante el COVID, donde prácticamente fuimos las mujeres las que amortiguamos la crisis de la pandemia al asumir el trabajo de cuidados, la atención sanitaria elemental de nuestras familias y también apoyamos el seguimiento de los planes educativos de nuestros hijos e hijas. Justamente en esta etapa del COVID fue cuando un grupo de diputadas tomamos la decisión de impulsar esta iniciativa de reforma al artículo cuarto constitucional. Pero antes de, de referirme concretamente a la propuesta, creo que tenemos que hacernos una pregunta muy importante. ¿Por qué somos las mujeres las que hacemos esta labor de cuidados? Porque en ese orden imaginado al que hacía referencia un gran escritor que es Harari, se establecieron los mandatos masculinos y los mandatos femeninos. Y dentro de estos mandatos que se configuraron, a los hombres se les dio el poder de dominación, lo cual incluía a las mujeres. Y a las mujeres pues se, les, se asumieron un papel de subordinación, donde incluso hay muchas mujeres que, eh, que encuentran sentido a su vida y le da valía a su propia vida a través de la satisfacción de las necesidades de los hombres y las familias. Este es un tema muy, sumamente importante porque esto implica cambiar un paradigma que está muy enraizado en la, en la sociedad, no solo en los hombres, sino en las propias mujeres. Esto eh, obviamente trajo varias consecuencias. Una es confinarnos al espacio privado. Eh, hacernos cargo, como ya decía, de la reproducción, la crianza, los cuidados y el trabajo doméstico sin recibir ningún tipo de reconocimiento ni de remuneración alguna por estos trabajos tan, tan importantes. Mientras los hombres se apropiaron del espacio público y las labores del mercado, 
donde ahí sí les fueron reconocidos sus trabajos y tienen un valor económico y son retribuidos. Bueno, a partir de esto eh, y de otros datos que les doy de manera muy rápida, en México este trabajo doméstico de cuidado, bueno, además de que ya dije que lo realizamos las mujeres, que invertimos alrededor de 40 horas a la semana para hacer estos trabajos de cuidados, mientras los hombres invierten 15 horas. Y si nosotros convertimos el trabajo de mujeres en el Producto Interno Bruto, que es el, los recursos que recibe todo el Estado, estamos hablando de que estamos nosotros eh, haciendo un trabajo que equivale al 23.5 del Producto Interno Bruto de nuestro país. Estamos hablando de alrededor de 6 millones y 6.4 billones de pesos. Este dato me parece muy importante, pero también decirles un dato adicional que el 60% de las mujeres en nuestro país no tienen trabajos remunerados y el 40% restante que sí los tiene, tienen trabajos muy precarios, este, no, no tienen ningún tipo de prestación laboral que reconoce la Constitución y muchas de ellas tienen que llevar a sus hijos para poder realizar el trabajo. Entonces estamos hablando de un problema grave de desigualdad que estamos viviendo las mujeres y yo diría que este es el enclave fundamental que tenemos que combatir para realmente lograr la igualdad sustantiva o la igualdad de derechos de las mujeres, no solo en México, sino en el mundo. A partir de esta problemática que, que, que se... Lorena, debe... Lorena, lo siento, dos minutos. ¿Está okay. bien? De acuerdo. Bueno, pues a partir de, 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 esta, de esta situación decidimos hacer la modificación constitucional que tiene varios propósitos. Uno es reconocer el derecho de todas las personas humanas a recibir y brindar cuidados, así como también el derecho al autocuidado y el derecho al tiempo propio. Contribuir, como ya decía, superar esta división sexual del trabajo y evitar la reproducción de las desigualdades de género. Establecer, esto es muy importante, la corresponsabilidad, no solo de los hombres, que es fundamental al interior de las casas, sino la responsabilidad del Estado mexicano y del mercado para que realmente podamos generar condiciones y las mujeres puedan desarrollar su proyecto de vida. Finalmente, les dejo aquí algunos mantras que establecimos en la discusión que nos parece que tienen que ser garantizados para todas las personas en el mundo. Nosotros lo hicimos justamente para el tema de cuidado. No los leo, se los dejo porque son muy bonitos, son muy importantes y ahí se resume toda la explicación y todas las motivaciones que tuvimos las diputadas en México para lograr esta importante reforma constitucional y termino diciéndoles que estamos en la construcción de un sistema nacional de cuidados porque nos parece que los cuidados tienen que ser un derecho universal y un derecho eh, transversal que, que, pues que sea eh, eh, un, eh, prioritario para constituir lo que se llama ya ahora la economía del cuidado. Con esto termino. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Lorena. And I've just seen that uh, MMM said they're going to share these in, in English, Spanish and French, because it seems to me those are really important. And thank you for the amazing work that you've been doing. So, uh, yeah, it was a real privilege to, to hear what you had to say there. Okay, so we're just now going to move on from the government sector. We're talking about these structural changes to companies in the corporate sector. And I'm delighted to introduce Francoise Cardoso, who's Director of Health and Nutrition, Early Childhood and, Early Childhood and Breastfeeding Support at Danone. She's a mother of four kids from three to 14 and has breastfed for more than 10 years. She holds a first degree in life sciences, a bachelor's degree in computational linguistics, as well as a master's in communication and new technologies. She worked in digital for 10 years and then Danone for 15, where she's been involved in knowledge management, competitive intelligence, digital health and well-being, as well as parented, par parenthood. She contributed to Danone's global parent, parental policy and its worldwide deployment and breastfeeding support to employees. You've packed a lot in, uh, Francoise, fantastic. So yeah, can you just talk to us about what role you think companies have in this piece around taking their share and supporting unpaid care work? 
What's Danone doing to support workers with care responsibilities, mothers and fathers? And how is this mutually beneficial for companies and for individuals as well? Francoise, uh, hand over the floor to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, having invited me. I think it's also nice to give uh, a voice uh, from uh, a private sector, uh, because I'm pretty sure that we all have a role to play in that field. Uh, and it's all together that we will succeed, of course. Um, so to your first question uh, regarding the role of companies, I think they play a key role uh, in, uh, in the taking care, care of, the, of the share and, and supporting and pair care work for different reasons. Uh, I think that the first one is that, um, you know, uh, we companies need to support their employees uh, and the employees uh, are human beings. They are just persons, you know, and uh, they have a personal life, but they have a professional life. And these lives are really interconnected. So sometimes you are a co-worker, sometimes you are a parent, sometimes you are a carer, sometimes you are a mother, a father. So, and, and I think it's very important that companies realize that. Um, I think that second one is that uh, uh, we have a, a role to play because, um, Working life has changed uh, throughout history, uh, and uh, we see, uh, thank you, and we see that um, we have an average uh, in the world, uh, I mean, we spend so many hours at work, so this is where also we need to, uh, to be uh, comfortable as, as, a, as a mother, as a father, as a carer, uh, and it's, uh, it's very important that companies take uh, into consideration that. Um, it's also, uh, and we've seen that in the picture uh, here that I put, that, you know, uh, the workforce is now more well balanced. Uh, so you have uh, men and women and, uh, you know, the companies really fight for this gender equality and to provide, you know, the same benefits for, uh, uh, for the two genders. Uh, and uh, it's very important that they consider uh, them uh, equally uh, in, that, um, in that care. And last point for companies, of course, is that, uh, you know, a company uh, needs to be profitable, of course. And I think that taking care of uh, the parents and more generally the carers uh, is also uh, for them a way to um, improve the performance of their employees, their efficiency, because, you know, by providing, you know, uh, uh, benefits to, to and, and facilities and uh, and uh, taking actions uh, to uh, to that audience, uh, I mean, parents will feel better. Uh, there will be less stress. Uh, they will be keen to uh, to to work uh, uh, in a more efficient way, and uh, uh, it's also a way to uh, leverage their skills. Because when you become a parent or when you are a, a carer, you have some skills that are very important uh, for corporates. You know, such as you are more focused. You can be I mean, you are more results oriented, you can prioritize, uh, you can delegate to others. And I can tell you by being a mother of four kids, uh, I'm really focusing on my task. So that's very, uh, uh, I mean, that, that's a, a, a super reason for, for companies. So now about Danone, what I can tell you, um, it all started with a, a, a commitment, a commitment our, of our CEO saying that uh, this is not uh, nice to have to support parents and, and carers, it's, uh, it's mandatory. Uh, and as soon as the commitment of the CEO is there, uh, we started to build a policy, a global parental policy that we deployed in more than 53 countries all over the world. And of course, we implemented it with local specificities. But the policy is not, you know, uh, okay, it's nice to have, but then how do you concretely do uh, uh, things? Um, so in the policy, we have three main uh, um, aspects of the uh, life stage, let's say, during parenthood. So we have the, uh, the prenatal support, so before, uh, before having the babies, the parental leave, which is when the parents are uh, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, taking care of their, of their, of their uh, babies. And we have the postnatal support. Um, first of all, our policy is gender neutral. So uh, whatever the couples are, uh, men, women, two, two men or two women, that's not a matter. You are a, a first parent and a second parent. Um, and what we do is that first, um, we support during the prenatal support uh, by increasing awareness about this uh, uh, 
important part of the life, what we call the first thousand days of life, that are very important and increasing the awareness about the change that may might appear uh, when the baby will be there. And even if even if it's not the first one, uh, you always you know discover things when when uh, the baby is there. So it's more around you know trainings. Uh, it's about uh, awareness. It's also um, uh, engaging with the the management because they need also to take care of their employees. So top management needs to be uh, really uh, trained uh, and to be uh, aware of uh, of uh, what will happen to the to the future parents. Then during the parent leaves, when mothers uh, and fathers accept, we can uh, stay in touch uh, and support them in these first days that are very, very uh, important. And especially um, when it comes to breastfeeding, a topic that is really dear to, uh, to my heart, uh, because you, we know that initiation of breastfeeding in the first hours, it's so crucial uh, in order to sustain the breastfeeding journey. So uh, we have created a network of, uh, um, of uh, parents within, uh, within the company, so uh, uh, 40 uh, around the world, in order to do kind of counseling to, this, uh, to, to their colleagues and help them, you know, in establishing breastfeeding, helping them, because it's really real time. I mean, uh, when you don't have time to, uh, to, to, to call the doctor or if you have an appointment two days after you have an issue, then you lose time. So it's very, it's very important. And of course, after the, they're, they're back to, to, to work, uh, we welcome them. Uh, we welcome them depending on when they want to, to come back to work. Uh, it can be flexible. Uh, they can be uh, 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 not uh, full time. They can also telework and all these things in place. So you can have a smooth uh, return to, to work. And of course, um, we support them to continue breastfeeding when they want to. Uh, so we have uh, 106 lactation rooms all around the world. We have networks of parents uh, to help them. Uh, we also have, of course, uh, flex breaks for them to pump and etc. So everything is down. And of course, um, all these actions um, are included in what we call the inclusive diversity roadmap because it's really uh, important that we put them uh, these actions into the into the the the, um, uh, the roadmap that is uh, uh, that is targeting you know this uh, uh, let's say uh, diversity uh, 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 skills. Uh, so how this is beneficial for companies? I think it's uh, it's it's beneficial, of course, for uh, uh, first for for the for the employees, of course, uh, but uh, supporting families um, is really fundamental. It's fundamental because. Uh, for companies, it contributes to their business. Uh, as I said, it increased their efficiency, it increased their performance. So it's not only, you know, caring for caring. Huh? It's also, you know, uh, um, of course, benefiting uh, to, to them uh, to contribute to, 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 the, to the efficiency of, uh, of the companies. For employees, of course, uh, and we have some studies that show that uh, internally, that it increased their well-being, their uh, less stress, uh, they are really valorized uh, in, in, in being uh, uh, parents. And in some countries, we really recognize these skills are, has really competencies uh, also in the workplace. Uh, so it's very important that uh, they feel comfortable and not, uh, you know, with uh, this particularity. It's really, it's really something that is acknowledged. Uh, then we Bonsoir, also- so Just one more minute, if that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, then, when one very important thing is that um, uh, it also has an impact on health uh, because uh, we also have a mission to that is uh, bringing health to food to as many as possible so health is really at the core of what we do so uh, we are convinced that uh, and and we show that uh, uh, of course um, the, the 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 parents were uh, uh, less uh, absent and they are also uh, kids as well uh, of course from from HR point of view, it's also very, uh, very important uh, to to, uh, to support uh, the parents, uh, and uh, yeah, and from uh, business side as well. So it's just something that is fundamental, and that uh, yeah, that it needs to be uh, needs to be uh, set up. I mean, uh, in all uh, in all companies, and uh, uh, yeah, and as shown in this in this picture, uh, you know, it's contributing to. To SDGs as well. It's really uh, highlighting, you know, the power of, of the families and of, of the carers. 
And uh, if I may just maybe say a word and maybe we're gonna say it later, but uh, um, I've been contributing to a certification that is called Family Friendly Company in order to recognize what companies do uh, towards their employees and to help them progress. Uh, and, and yeah, this level has been deployed in, in some organization and we are growing. Uh, and of course we certify also some entities at Danone and it's very important that we, uh, we recognize these efforts. Thank you, Nikki. Merci, Francoise. Thank you. I'm sorry having to rush you, rush you through. There's just so much again that I could say. We just wanted to, so do start putting any questions in the chat. I see there've been a few already, which I will pick up in a minute. But I thought I would just, I'd, I'd like to, to kind of get you four talking to each other. And one of the things that you've been doing is talking a lot about the successes and the impact. I'm just wondering whether some of the challenges that you've faced in your different spheres, like Francoise, you were talking about, yeah, great to have a policy, but unless that policy gets implemented and really, you know, is effective on the ground, then the policy is not enough on its own. So I'm just wondering if you could each say one main challenge that you think the organization has faced in trying to do this work. Um, Lorena, I'm hoping they're translating for you. So one, just one main challenge, or if you'd rather, because we probably only have time for one little round, do ask one of the other panelists a question. So you can either say one main challenge or you can ask one of the other panelists a question. Um, so let's, let's start with, let's go back to the beginning. Ilaria, if you could kick off with either a challenge or a question, um, and then we'll, we'll move around um, in that same order. And the translators are saying, please keep, uh, we're trying to, I'm trying to talk slowly, tr try and talk slowly because it's hard for them to translate. Yeah, it's actually one challenge that will turn into a question um, <laughs> because one of the things I said before is that I said the program is successful because it uses what we call a soft entry point, which is fatherhood. Um, and there is a lot of thinking around that, especially within the Men Engage Alliance and the Men Engage organizations in terms of accountability towards women and women's rights organization. Because we, we know that engaging men as fathers is a successful way of doing it, but it has also has its shortcomings. Because what if a man is not a father? What if uh, the father thinks that he has to be engaged just for the benefit of his own daughter? What if he starts seeing women as just daughters and wives and not as human, full human beings that deserve um, to be equally treated? So how do we use fatherhood to enter the space, but how do we push uh, the discourse even farther? I think this is one thing that we are trying to explore, but not yet reached. So I wanted to, to actually hear from uh, probably ASEV, because I think they, they have been doing a similar type of project, how they think around that. That's it. Thank you very much. Suna, over to you. So, um, Ilaria, everything you say resonates um, with us at Achev. So, um, first of all, there are some pockets in civil society and academics that are pushing for way more progressive policies all the time in Turkey. But there's a significant increase in conservatism in the policies towards women. And exactly like you're saying, the subject matter, gender equality is a sensitive topic. So I really like how you're saying we are also using a soft entry point of fatherhood. Um, I could just say one way we've been able to get around it uh, has been to find tactful messages, prepare our content with ca cautions to avoid resistance. Um, so we kind of emphasize the common denominators and shared values around healthy child development, fatherhood, parenting, rather than direct messages around gender equality and prevention uh, of violence against women. Um, I have to say today in Turkey, violence against women, particularly intimate partner violence is such a major public health problem. So we're really trying to tackle that while, like you said, find tactful and soft entry points. I can, I can go and list more challenges, but I'm aware of the time. Lorena, do you want to say something about some of the challenges or respond to what Ilaria and Suna have been saying? 
Eh, yo, yo quisiera hacer eh, primero un reconocimiento al, al enorme trabajo que están haciendo las organizaciones de la sociedad civil para favorecer la igualdad al interior de los hogares. Lo mismo para las empresas que asumen su responsabilidad con los trabajadores generándoles mejores condiciones. Pero para nosotros en México el reto hoy es que el Estado se involucre directamente en la generación de servicios de políticas públicas y que destine presupuestos para que el trabajo de cuidado sea redistribuido y que, y que las mujeres puedan desarrollar sus proyectos de vida, porque en, la, en los términos actuales, si no hay un apoyo del Estado muy importante, pues se va a seguir reproduciendo esto y es justamente lo que pretendemos evitar. Tenemos un reto muy, muy grande de ir modificando todos aquellos ordenamientos jurídicos que lo que están haciendo es justamente reproducir estos estereotipos donde las mujeres tienen el monopolio de los cuidados. Y me parece que un tema que podríamos impulsar desde las empresas con el Estado es el tema de las licencias parentales. Necesitamos garantizar que los padres tengan el mismo tiempo para el cuidado de los, de los hijos o las hijas que las madres. En México tienen 12 semanas las mujeres para cuidar a sus hijos y los hombres tienen una semana. Eh, entonces es muy desproporcionado. Y, y decirles que en la medida que los hombres, que ustedes los, lo han acreditado plenamente, en la medida que los hombres se involucren en los trabajos de cuidado, también estaremos contribuyendo a, el, a la erradicación de la violencia, porque los cuidados generan empatía, que es un elemento central para ir disminuyendo este tipo de, de, de flagelo que también vive México, que es el tema de la violencia de género. Entonces, para nosotros el reto es obligar al Estado a que asuma su responsabilidad y genere las condiciones para que podamos las mujeres ejercer plenamente nuestros derechos. Gracias, Lorena. Some really important points as well. Françoise, do you want to come in on any other commenting on what the others have said or something about the challenges? Yeah, for sure. I think that um, from, I mean, from organizations point of view, I mean, corporate point of view, for me, what's very important is that, as I said, the policy does not, I mean, it's, it's the starting point, but it's not the, what makes you successful. And what's very important is, is to listen to listen to your employees' needs, what their perception is, um, what their issues are, you know, because then you can really propose something that is adapted to what they, what they, they, they want. And uh, it's more uh, evident at Danon because we are in many countries with many cultural differences. And it's very important that we listen to that because you can have a global policy that is uh, super offering you know many parental leave days and etc but you need to deep dive and really offer something that is uh, that is fitting with with the with the what the employees uh, need a second one is that um it needs to be inclusive inclusive in that way that uh, it's for all uh we never you know cluster you are a parent you are not you are a mother you are a father it's really for everyone and we have you know, in our networks, uh, some people who are not uh, parent, but they are very interested, you know, in, uh, you know, understanding better, uh, caring about their colleagues as well, you know, and for me, it's also very, uh, it's, it's a challenge because then, you know, uh, you need to make this topic, you know, for all uh, and not to make it a, a niche, let's say. Uh, and uh, when we say also inclusive is that uh, it's not only targeting uh, where you have um, the most of the workforce uh, are mothers. I mean, uh, if you say, oh, we reach 80% uh, of the employees, what about the 20% remaining? I mean, if you don't do 100, for me, you know, it's so that's the challenge that you have to really be uh, targeting everyone. So that's huge, huge work, but, uh, uh, but it's very important. Yeah, I love the way you described that earlier on. You know, I think sometimes we talk about parenthood in a very binary way and the way that you've described that, it's very, very inclusive. 
you're all of you already picking up on some of the questions that are pouring in, which we're, we're now going to move on to. We won't get to all of them, I'm afraid, but there have been a couple around thinking about um, universal basic income, household based tax, universal child benefit, pensions for caregiving and also payment for caregiving, which is always a huge discussion in this area. I wonder if any of you got any have any thoughts about um, the economic side of this. Um, Diana, I know you've had some some thinking about that as well. Um, maybe we could start with you. You've been thinking about universal basic income. How does that relate to unpaid care work? Pues sí, sí me gustaría. Me parece que el gran reto es cómo, cómo lograr que los cuidados o por lo menos los cuidados especializados sean remunerados. En el caso de México tenemos un doble, un doble pro, problema porque la mayor parte de las personas trabajan en la economía informal y esto les impide el acceso a, a una serie de, de a, a, no, les impide el acceso a la seguridad social. La seguridad social en México comprende el derecho a las guarderías, a las pensiones, entre otras cosas. Entonces, tenemos nosotros como reto es que, la, que las mujeres que trabajan en la economía informal o las personas se formalice para que tengan acceso a los derechos y que las mujeres que están cuidando a sus hijos, que no necesariamente a todas se les, tiene, se les puede apoyar, pero sí a las que tengan condiciones más precarias, y se les ayuda de diferentes maneras, no solamente a lo mejor con transferencias directas, que no estamos tan de acuerdo con eso, porque eso no resuelve el problema de la desigualdad, sino más bien garantizando instituciones de, de, o, o servicios que le permitan a ella contar con ese, ese cuidado por parte del Estado. Me refiero a estas famosas guarderías, a las escuelas de tiempo completo, a las licencias que se den en las mismas condiciones. Digamos, es un conjunto de iniciativas, pero además decir, que creo que es lo que te interesa, Niki, decir que si las mujeres te, tuviéramos acceso al mercado formal, estaríamos contribuyendo de manera muy significativa en el crecimiento económico del país. Los cuidados pueden ser un elemento muy importante de crecimiento, de desarrollo económico en cualquier país. Entonces, creo que la apuesta, además de, de dar condiciones de igualdad y romper con esos estereotipos, podemos pensar también en términos de progreso para los países, generando las condiciones adecuadas. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, some of these are very complex questions because they're all interlinked, aren't they? And, and uh, fundamentally, they come down to the fact of we don't we don't value care work, whether it's paid or unpaid, in the same way that we value other work. Francoise, I don't know whether you could answer a question around the va how you how you value care work, and that might be about with money, but it might be in other things. How do you ensure that care work is something that that everybody values, not just the people who are parents or carers? Um, I think that, yeah, of course, I talk about performance and uh, efficiency, of course, but it's also a matter of, um, you know, the time uh, you spend, uh, you know, uh, that is covered by social insurance or not, you know, and that, you know, as a company, you can, you can really uh, take that into consideration to really reduce these costs, you know, uh, because it's less costly for you as a company. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's also important that uh, uh, we, we look at, you know, uh, this uh, balance, you know, between uh, uh, what, uh, you know, it costs to the, to the country, to the economy, uh, and uh, uh, what it costs to, 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 uh, to a company with, uh, with the, the, the fact that they, they win in return, you know, uh, the, the, the employees, uh, uh, skills, uh, time and efficiency and etc. So that's, yeah, that's something, that's why we are looking at, you know, um, very specific things where the people need, you know, to, uh, uh, to be supported uh, in order to, uh, yeah, make this also more fluid, you know, and not a break between, you know, uh, what the, the, the society, the government, the social insurance can cover and what we can do uh, as well. So that's, 
Yeah. yeah, and I guess recognizing that the skills you learn in parenting are skills that are useful in the rest of the world. Yeah, so there's a number of questions coming up around um, how you work with um, men. Um, you know, how do you, I think uh, Wenceslas says, how do you um, help boys and men change their attitudes in helping um, helping women? Actually, I would never use the word helping. How do you share the work, the work at home? How do you change men's attitudes? And I think there's something around working with boys. But I think when, when Lorena, you and I were talking before this, I was saying, well, how do you change male members of parliament as well? So you also need to change the attitudes of men in power. So Suna, Ilaria, you've done, you've, your organizations have a lot of experience in working with men. Do you have any key thoughts around how you can change men, men, men's attitudes to this? And I, I take the point, I think it was Francoise that said it's also important to change women's attitude because we as women also, you know, need to move on this. But any thoughts from Suna, why don't you start? Any thoughts from you on changing men or women's attitudes around this? So um, just a few quick practical tips that we have come to understand uh, plays an important role in recruiting fathers to the programs. Um, we hold the father support program sessions in the evenings. Something as simple as this uh, has made such a difference. Um, we, we try to make sure that the facilitator provides the information uh, through our structured programs, but then it is a group dynamic where men, fathers all talk to one another and understand the common experiences they have among themselves, um, where they can actually open up and these are closed group sessions in the father support program where um, 15 to 20 fathers begin together and continue for a course of 13 to 15 weeks. Um, it, it really helps to empower fathers in their roles, as I said, as, as um, fathers talk about topics of empathy, democratic relationships that um, apply both to their spouse and to their children. Um, I just want to make an additional uh, point. Um, in Turkey, we've realized a huge uh, significant ratio um, uh, of the uh, fathers, men are in private sector. And we've, uh, we understood that, okay, so if we're talking about a broader mental shift, we have to bring all fronts together. So in the last couple of years, um, we've been working and collaborating with the private sector and trying to get them to also um, promote sharing care work. For example, push for paternity leave policies or promote fatherhood programs as part of their uh, HR policies um, and sort of um, lay the groundwork to remove barriers um, existing, impacting the existing legislative frameworks and try to get uh, fathers to be supported. Um, so I think the bottom line for us uh, would be, we've learned that we really need to partner with them and collaborate with them. Thank you. Great, thanks for some really useful tips. Um, yeah, I'm sure we can all learn from that as well. Uh, Ilaria, anything from you in terms of how to move this forward, either with men at the grassroots or with women at the grassroots, but also people in power because you've been working with the government too, haven't you? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe I would say that uh, everything that Suna says resonates and makes uh, total sense. And that's also a similar approach that we use in Rwanda. I just wanted to complement what she says uh, by adding a couple of things. Uh, definitely in any men engaged program. So we are engaging men to transform social norms, but there is a need always to also engage women, engage the wives because we found out in some of the programming we did at the very beginning that by leaving women out, you actually find a sort of backlash by them to some extent because they, are, they also grew up in the same uh, patriarchal order. So they also expect certain roles and certain things to be carried out and accomplished by men. Um, and then another thing, it's also about engaging the community at large because some of the other things that we found is that some of these transformed men when they, while they are safe within the safe space with other men, they discuss and they appreciate, as I said, they see the benefits. Once they go out and maybe they um, meet other men in the community, 
um, they sometimes face resistance, they are laughed at, and uh, it is really what uh, might uh, even reduce like the long-term impact because some of them might carry out some of the things they do or share the unpaid care work at home without really advocating for it out of the home because they feel like it's right, but they are not proud in, in front of other men. So we realize that in terms of programming, it's always important to add a sort of community component or community activism component, possibly with the support of the local gov government, maybe local authorities that call upon these men and present them as, as, um, as uh, role models. That's why even Bandeberheu, that's the name. So they become a sort of role models within their own community so that other men can aspire, they are given a platform so that they are also valued. And uh, indeed, it's uh, all about really working very closely with the government. In Rwanda, we have really the luck, if I may say, the, a big support and political will. It's not yet perfect. It's not that we have everything in place, but the political will from some of the ministries is there. So it's about really working closely with them and to think around, for example, Rwanda is very famous for having reached the gender parity in terms of number. And now we were very happy to see that in the last national gender policy, it, is, it explicitly says that we have to go beyond the number, that we have to go towards and strive towards gender transformation. And I believe that this was really the, um, the result of a lot of work between CSOs and the government themselves. So there was a lot of kind of cross-pollination, like working together, influencing each other, even having people in the government that used to belong to the CSOs. So when they were now called in the government, they had really this mindset and this uh, approach. So yes, this collaboration is definitely very key as well. Thank you very much. We're almost at the end. There's a couple, there's a couple more things I'm just gonna pick up on. Fantastic questions in the chat, and I think if some of them aren't answers, maybe we can, as MMM, can get back to, to people later on. But there was one observation about you get from an Aya, I think you get training for every job in life, but what about training for parenting? Um, and she says, are there are there are very few possibilities to get good quality training which could then be recognised as soft skills? I don't know, Francoise, whether your family. The initiative you were talking about with families is part of that or whether anybody else wants to answer a question around so training on parenting for mothers and fathers i guess achev and ilari in some ways that's what you're doing in terms of doing it in a gender transformative way um but francoise i wondered to see if you can add to yeah. that from the corporate perspective of course i fully agree I, lo I love this question very much i think it's 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 true i mean you never learn how to become a parent or a carer i mean there's not a you know a, a tutorial that you can follow and then you apply and that's it so that's why i think it's super important that uh, not only companies uh, but everyone i mean uh, governments institutions associations society i mean we need really to to pay attention to uh, uh, to that um, it's why also I'm uh, I'm working very closely to United Nations Tra um, UNITAR United Nations Institute for Training and Research in order to create to create these capabilities on parenthood on breastfeeding support and will provide with this uh, uh, with this platform and this e course that will be a kind of yeah certification for for those who want to, to care and of course this label for me family friendly company it's 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 uh, uh, an opportunity to not hide things, you know, to be proud uh, and to demystify, you know, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, yes, you need to to um, that you need to to uh, uh, to increase this awareness through uh, through uh, through training and and uh, and research and to echo with with what uh, has been said uh, by Ilaria and and Suna is that for fathers, for instance, we really encourage them. Uh, we uh, train them in, you know, why it's important uh, to become a father, why these 1000 days are very important in their life for them, for their babies, for their health, and for the, the entire family. So then it's not a taboo, you can uh, leave earlier because your son is sick, or because you need to stay at home, and that's life. So I think it's, yeah, training is, 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 um, is key. We're almost out of time. I just want to ask Lorena one more question. So I know that you've had that initiative trying to get it into the constitution. What next in Mexico? What's what, what's what's going to happen now? 
with some questions. Uh, that was a question for everybody, but I'm going to give Lorena bueno, the last. Eh, lo primero last. que quiero decir es que esta iniciativa se logró porque en México eh, tenemos la paridad en los órganos legislativos y en todos los niveles de gobierno. La mitad de los espacios públicos en, en nuestro país están ocupados por mujeres. Gracias a que tuvimos al 50% de mujeres diputadas, hemos logrado impulsar una serie de iniciativas para generar mejores condiciones y lograr eventualmente la, la igualdad sustantiva, que sabemos que no solo depende de las leyes, sino también depende de las prácticas y de la cultura que vayamos eh, eh, implantando en la sociedad. Como, con ese trabajo importante de educación con los hombres y con las mujeres. Eh, lo que sigue ahora es elaborar el Sistema Nacional de Cuidados, donde se defina claramente cuáles son las responsabilidades de las empresas, cuáles son las responsabilidades del Estado y también cuáles son las responsabilidades de la comunidad y de las propias familias, hombres y mujeres. ¿Qué instrumentos se van a construir para que logremos que estos cuidados sean redistribuidos, retribuidos, este, eh, reconocidos y reducir la carga de trabajo, que es lo que nos está agobiando a, a la carga de trabajo que tienen actualmente las mujeres. No es un tema sencillo porque cruza por varias instituciones. Entonces, lo que estamos haciendo ahora es un inventario de todas las políticas sociales que tenemos y las tenemos que, tenemos que hacer un trabajo de ingeniería para que se puedan articular todas estas políticas de cuidado y que realmente logremos grandes resultados. Y el otro reto es que, que las personas en este país tengan pues, acceso a la seguridad social porque eso de entrada te da una condición totalmente distinta y te da acceso justamente a algunas de estas prestaciones como pueden ser las guarderías, entre otras cosas importantes. Entonces, en ese trabajo estamos ahora en la conformación de un sistema nacional de cuidados que ya se hizo en Uruguay y que en Argentina ya se hizo una ley también para establecer este sistema y ahora México está en este gran debate, estamos todavía inmersos en ese debate y espero que en los próximos meses podamos hablar ya de un sistema nacional de cuidados en nuestro país. Fantastic. That seems like a very good um, way to end this amazing conversation. Thank you to all of you um, on the chat. I know there's, if there are any specific questions you've asked us, we'll try and get back to them later on. We'll also share the recording and we will also share various links that our wonderful panelists have, have um, put and sent to us in advance. So. Yeah, care is a collective responsibility. So part of what we're trying to do with this webinar is to contribute to that conversation to ensure that we really think about in very practical ways how we take this forward. And I think our four speakers have been fantastic in doing that. So thank you so much. And I will hand back to Anne Claire to finish off. Thank you so much to all of you, all our amazing panelists. Really, you were clear, practical, competent, engaged, inspiring. Uh, really, thank you. You all kept your time. It was really a conversation, as uh, uh, Nikki said, that we would like to continue with all of you because there is a lot to do and you have been engaged in such a process. So thank you very much for doing us the honor to be uh, in our panel. Thank you also to our interpreters, Marina, Tony, and particularly to Marilies. Marilies is our secretary general. She's not a professional interpreter, but she did today an incredible job in translating into French. And really, Marilies, thank you because it's a tough job and you did it beautifully. Thank you to all MMM teams who've been working behind the scene, Shanaz for the communications, uh, Melanie, Eva, Caroline, and a very warm and special thank to uh, Valérie. Because as Nikki says, uh, Valérie is our webinar queen. And uh, not only because uh, she, Valérie, please come, come turn on your camera if you can, because uh, 
you have uh, so many competencies, but you have such a strong commitment to the cause of mothers. So thank you very much because you made this series happen and this sequel was great and uh, really with all our heart, congratulations. And thank you also to all our participants uh, because you all participating in our panels are instrumental to make things happen and change happening. So we uh, give you a rendezvous for next year for the <laughs> season four and uh, we are all hopefully uh, hopefully we'll all be there again to discuss unpaid care work we'll get back in touch with you for the take uh, take um, take out of this session thank you to all and uh, thank you for keeping the time we are closing just before three so all the best <laughs>